I'd like to introduce our first keynote speaker for the theme of governance and corruption, exploring the Latin America Asia Pacific nexus. It is my pleasure to be here in bright sunny Australia with Jairo after having spent many years researching Latin America from a damp, dark basement at the University of Oxford, where he was the Ronaldo Faulkner Scholar at St. Anthony's College and a recipient of the British Severing Scholarship. Jairo, Jairo Acuña Alfaro has now since gone on to work as a policy advisor on public administration reform and anti-corruption in the UNDP Vietnam office since October 2007. In that capacity, Jairo has helped develop several policies regarding national public sector and civil service reform. In particular, he has provided policy advice and in interventions with governments for the formulation and approval of civil service laws and the adoption, implementation and monitoring of anti-corruption strategies the UN Convention Against Corruption, and the establishment of monitoring and evaluation frameworks on anti-corruption and public service delivery. Jairo is also proud to have been the lead architect of a pioneering effort to measure governance and public administration performance from a citizen's experience entitled the Vietnam Provincial Governance and Public Administration Performance Index, known as PAPI. PAPI is now a multi year policy monitoring tool that supports policy making processes both at the central and local levels. Keeping on his academic interest, Jairo is also the editor of a series of policy discussion papers on public administration reform and anti-corruption of the UNDP Vietnam and he engages regularly with leading Asian experts on these issues. Jairo's experience in government and public sector reform in such organizations as the World Bank, the Danish Inter International Development Agency in Ghana, uh, the Tecnologia de Monterrey in Mexico, and the International Center for Sustainable Human Development, um, and the Central American <coughs> Supreme Audit Institutions Organization Transparency International, and UNDP Costa Rica, where Jairo comes from. So it is with great pleasure that I present Jairo, who's going to be talking, giving us a lecture um, entitled, Shifting Debates from Democracy and Development to Governance and Corruption, Latin America and Asia Pacific and Comparative Perspective. Thank you. Thank you very much to the Latin American Center, ANCLAS. Thank you very much, Dr. Fenwick, for the uh, invitation. And thank you very much for reminding me about these years in this cold and damped basement uh, in Oxford where we share a desk for about three years uh, doing the research on Latin America. Um, it's been seven years since I'm really not much working on Latin American issues, right? Um, so for me, you know, it would be a challenge, you know, to, you know, to start this discussion uh, this morning. But I thought that you know perhaps you know I could bring it um, 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 a debate um, from a Costa Rican living in a one-party state for about eight years now in the East Asia, right? Um, and through my presentation this morning, I will just try to go back to some of the debates that were very prominent um, in the earlier um, years and try to make the connections between what I think were the main differences between the two regions, between you know, East Asia and the Pacific and um, Latin America. I think that you know, I, was, um, I was intrigued by the title of this uh, um, series of this um, discussion, shifting sands, um, and I think that you know it's not only shifting between one region to another one, but also from one topic um, to another one, uh, in some sort of circular forms, right? Um, in uh, in in Asia and um, in Latin America, um, in those years where Tracy and I share a desk in this cold, damp basement that it was also dark, right? Um, most of my work was 
to try to understand you know, what were the connections between t democratization processes and human development, mostly in Latin America, in two small countries, in, in Costa Rica and in um, El Salvador. I have to confess that after moving to Vietnam and seeing the dynamism of the East Asia um, countries, then I had to rethink you know, that initial hypothesis or, 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 or approach, how do we understand you know, um, democratization uh, processes and how you know, we need to try to move, to look forward to more unorthodox approaches you know, to the issue. Now, let me start you know, um, uh, my presentation by making a very quick uh, observation between the differences between East Asia and, and the Pacific. I have a picture here. Can somebody in the room tell me where that picture is from? Is it from Asia and the Pacific, or is it from Latin America? Asia. How many in Asia? How many in Latin America? 50-50. Right? No, it's in Vietnam. Right? Right? It's the Hamong, is the Sapa uh, region, border uh, between Vietnam and China. And you know, the reason that you know I want to you know to show this picture is that Latin America and East Asia, or Asia and the Pacific, share much more features and commonalities than one normally assumes. Right? Despite you know this in geographic. Uh, um, distance between the two regions. I was particularly amused the first time that I traveled to this region uh, in Vietnam because I felt as, as if I was walking in Guatemala, right? Um, and people look remarkably similar, their factions, right? Perhaps, you know, a bit uh, darker, perhaps, you know, that picture doesn't make much justice, you know, to the overall a population uh, in the region, but the fabrics, the clothes, you know, the products that they make, remarkably similar. So that made me think, in particular, are we really that different, you know, between Latin America and um, the Asia um, region? And at the end of the day, I think that um, we are not that different, right? But we have gone through different. Um, stages both of democratization, of governance dynamics, and of uh, development uh, process. The issues that one hears in Latin America, in terms of governance, in terms of democratization, are also the same issues that are being heard in East Asia and the Pacific, right, in terms of um, governance and democratization um, aspects with different levels of, of intensities and different um, um, approaches, but at the end of the day, the topics are the same. In the in the last years of the of the of the 20th century, democracy or democratization was the issue um, in Latin America. Now that debate seems to be shifting more towards okay, the good governance agenda or the transparency um, aspects. The same, I think, is happening in uh, in East Asia, right? When one uh, talks about politics in Asia. Right? The issues of democratization, the issues of transparency, the issues of good governance come across um, uh, prominently. Now, um, as a background for you know, uh, my presentation, I think that you know, um, the, the main rationale is that this debate on this relationship between governance and corruption is first of all a legacy of the previous debate between dem democracy and development. Right? So basically what we are seeing now in, in terms of all this good governance um, um, agenda of more transparency, less corruption, better or more inclusive uh, development processes is a legacy of that debate. Right? But that debate is, a, ha, ha, while happening simultaneously in both regions, right, is having different approaches on how this is um, um, addressed by um, different uh, political um, systems. That is, you know, I believe that this debate has shifted to the point where transparency today seems to be to the 21st century what democracy was to the 20th century, right? There was a big discussion in the earlier century that democracy was the panacea, the answer 
for all the development uh, processes. And now it seems that now, you know, the big word that has been used in, in, in many policy debates is this good governance, this transparency uh, debate. Um, the emergence of democracy was considered as the quintessential product of the last century. And you know, this is a phrase that I'm borrowing from Amartya Zen, mainly with the, the democratization waves um, in Latin America, followed by the ends of the military regimes and authoritarian states in Asia and the Pacific, right? And the governance mechanisms that came along with these uh, democratization processes, right? Including transparency. Interestingly, having worked for eight years now in a one-party state, right, in a communist system, transparency seems to be a very important policy issue of discussion even the issues of participation, which is the same issues that I was working on in Central America during um, the 1990s. So the question that I would like all of us you know, to think you know, through, my, through, through um, this presentation is that, what does this shift in the debate tell us about the nexus between Latin America and Asia Pacific? Are the issues really that different between the two regions, right? Or is it a differences in the approach on how these different aspects are addressed? In my opinion, they are basically the same, right? With some levels of contextualization, of course, you know, that need to be um, addressed. But most importantly, you know, the political settlements play a very important role. And you know, it is the understanding of these political settlements right, that will help us to disentangle, to decipher what triggers some societies and in some context you know, to be more inclusive and trigger uh, higher development uh, dividends, um, so to speak. Right? The starting point, I believe, is that you know, in the 80s and 90s, the debate was about the sequencing options for policy reform, right? And there was this discussion, you know, what goes first, democracy or development? You know, we had the modernization theory, right, that it will say, you know, um, you will not achieve democracy until you have reached, you know, certain levels of development. And there was the discussion, is this, does this linear or there are, you know, stepped um, approaches or, uh, or so forth? Um, Francis Stewart at the University of, of Oxford perhaps you know, initiated this debate when, when, uh, when, when, when she and, and, and Gustav Rannis uh, start thinking about the sequencing between economic growth and human development, making the point that um, uh, economic growth um, was a product of uh, human development, right? that human development was larger than economic growth, and if you wanted to sustain uh, 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 high rates of economic growth, human development must uh, be given priority in terms of policy uh, options, right? And then if we have that argument, then one would expect that, you know, uh, um, um, democracy, right, as the question whether democracy is a requisite for human development um, or not, and then you have a series of options in terms of policy of, you know, what should be given priority either democratization processes or development uh, processes. That was basically you know, the different sequencing of policy options during the debates in the 80s and, and, and 90s. I think that that debate, um, without being conclusive, right, has now shifted, right, and has now shifted you know, to try to understand, OK, maybe it was not democracy as we were understanding. Um, a democracy in the Western sense uh, of of um, of the concept, right? But more about you know these governance dynamics that, that were happening. Um, but I think that you know it's important if if if, if we can you know quickly go through uh, this period, uh, um, the past uh, 30 years, and, and and rethink you know how all these um, uh, debates are shifting now. And help us, you know, to understand um, what would be, you know, the you know the new policy options or the sequencing of um, options, right?
many of the studies on these relationships between democracy and development focus on, on these large N um, countries that basically will show that, you know, that there are a group of countries that have modernized already and uh, are moving towards, you know, the high levels of development and therefore, you know, high levels of uh, democratization. But then you have all these groups, all these countries staggered and grouped in one end, right? And then you have the other section of countries that had not reached, you know, their levels of, of, of democracy, but stagger around, right, at different levels of uh, development. During the last 10 years of uh, the 20th century. So it was very difficult, you know, to differentiate, you know, what is making these countries to achieve democracy first or human development later, or human development first or development process first, and then uh, democratization um, later, right? And then you will have all these debates that, well, when you start dis disaggregating the level of analysis, you will start to see that, you know, countries that are non-democracies, you know, have also been able to achieve high levels of human development, right? So it question, you know, all these, you know, modernization um, theory uh, processes, you know, that, you know, perhaps, you know, the democratization was not this prerequisite, you know, to achieve, you know, high rates um, of development. And then you have a few countries that were considered democratic countries with very low levels of uh, human development that, again, you know, challenge you know, that conventional wisdom in terms of you know, to what extent you know, modernization theory is so linear in that uh, discussion, right? You know, to what extent um, uh, uh, one can really make the argument that um, in order to achieve certain levels of development, certain levels of, of political freedoms and democratization processes uh, have to be put uh, in place. And then one can start thinking, okay, you know, what was happening in Latin America during this period? What was happening in Asia and um, the Pacific, right? Um, and the issues, um, in, in, in my opinion, were not that different, right? And, 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 and Latin America, of course, you know, was, was you know, perhaps, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, experiencing um, uh, these uh, democratization waves, but then we also had shifts towards democratization in Asia and the Pacific, right? Uh, with some reversals in, in, in some states, the end of, uh, of, of military um, authoritarian regimes uh, uh, in, uh, in the region. I'm thinking about Indonesia, uh, for example, which is you know, about you know, the same time that um, the third wave was ending in the, um, Latin America. Then the, the debate also assumed that it was a factor of democracies on average having higher levels of development, right? So it was given for granted, you know, that this was, you know, you know that this was the explanation uh, for the uh, uh, for the issue. But here, you know, we had you know countries that were again democracies with very little scores in terms of development, right? And non-democracies with very high scores in terms of uh, uh, development. In each of the last 30 years, you know, the last three decades of, of, of the century. But then, you know, even though that was the pattern across um, um, the two different, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, relationships, the more income, wealth the countries had, also the higher the levels of democracy and non-democracy from both um, 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 discussions. And then we had countries in both categories, you know, from both regions. We had the, um, democracies um, in Latin America with high levels of income and non-democracies in East Asia and the Pacific with high um, levels of um, income. Part of the, you know, but the problem with this, with, 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 with this level of, of, of aggregation is that it's very difficult to, to disentangle and to determine, okay, who is driving or which country is driving the relationship of the, of, of, 
um, of the association, the direction of that um, debate. And what, what I think that is relevant to do is to try to disentangle you know, and you know, try to analyze you know, country by country, region uh, by region. And this is something that, you know, that I try to do here with this typology of classification of development and democracy performance between 1975 and 2002. And what one can see is that you know, th these vicious, virtuous, and or loop-sided patterns of uh, democratization and uh, development processes. Right? One can see the Latin American countries, you know, the blue, the, the blue uh, triangles, all clustered mostly around virtuous cycle of democratization and development uh, process, right? Some of them more geared towards the, the, the democracy side um, of the equation, and only two countries in the vicious circle, Paraguay and Guatemala. The vicious circles, I mean low levels of democratization, low levels of development. The countries from East Asia and the Pacific had a relatively different um, 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 uh, classification uh, in that regard. Here, you know, we have uh, fewer data um, that is uh, available, but then you will see countries like Fiji and Thailand, you know, more on the democracy side um, of the equation, right? But then, you know, have you know, the, the, the outliers of Singapore, right, with very high levels of development very uh, uh, um, average levels of uh, democratization, China or Indonesia, uh, for example. Now, the problem with this, again, right, if, if one continues you know, making the analysis, right, that this is a very static picture, right? It just gives you a snapshot of what is happening in, you know, in all these countries, right? But that doesn't tell us about you know, what are the transitions that these countries were making um, um, over time, and we'll know that you know that you know th uh, uh, these processes are not static, right? And we have seen countries, you know, transitioning towards democracy and falling back. Um, we have seen countries progressing in terms of, of of development and then you know falling back. You know, especially you know the middle income or you know the low middle income countries. You know, the middle income trap um, and so forth. What I did then was you know try to understand. What, has be, what have been the movements of these countries um, over the years, right? And here, you know, we have these movements uh, for a bunch of, of Latin American countries from 1975 to the year 2002, where, you know, most of this debate, you know, was happening in terms of what are the policy options uh, available for um, governments and, and policy makers. And, um, and we can try, you know, to try to see where these countries were transitioning, which countries were having a linear, gradual, ascending um, transition from lower levels of democracy to towards higher levels of democracy and increases levels of uh, development. Very similar patterns happen in East Asia and the Pacific, and you know, one can make you know, that analysis to try to understand you know, how that this happened. Right? And this is how it looks in a more dynamic way. Right? You know, how countries were moving from one uh, region, uh, uh, from one pattern of, of, of transition um, than others. And again, you see that it's the Latin American countries that perhaps were much more volatile in terms of moving from one cycle or one quadrant of the equation uh, to the other one. Right? But there were very few countries that made the transition back. And once countries had made the transition to a virtuous circle, virtually nobody had returned to, or at least during that period, you know, returned you know, to, you know, to, to, to other um, um, quadrant. The East Asian and the Pacific countries, you know, they mostly made movements around the same quadrants. So they were not moving from one region to uh, 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 from one um, um, side of the debate uh, from the other. Then the question I think that emerges, in, and you know, one can you know raise you know a series of of, of hypotheses, right? What was happening 
in Latin America that was different from what was happening in East Asia and the Pacific, that made countries in Latin America shift from different quadrants, right? Or shift from, from, you know, from different cycles of, uh, of the debate as opposed to the East Asia and the Pacific countries that basically remained on the same uh, 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 patterns um, of the relationship, right? Then the whole question came of, okay, what has made this shift happen, right? What has made, you know, these uh, transitions um, happen? And here, you know, I want to now, you know, I, having spoken about this relationship between democracy and development, now let's try to focus on, you know, the, 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 the shift of the debate, not in geographical terms, but more in conceptual and uh, political terms, right, of now that the debate is about transparency, uh, good governance, right, uh, how are these two processes different, right? We were uh, talking earlier with, uh, with one of the colleagues um, about, you know, what had happened in Costa Rica, in my country, you know, where one former president um, was um, uh, indicted for corruption uh, charges, right, um, in Latin America, at the same time, you know, that there were also um, corruption trials of high-level political figures in a Asia and the Pacific um, uh, region, right? What, uh, what does it mean to this transparency debate, right? What, you know, what does it mean to, to this um, good governance uh, debate? And here is, uh, you know, again, you know, trying, you know, to bring the data uh, uh, for the analysis, you know. Uh, in, in order to make a comparison between East Asia and Latin America, um, I'm, I'm, I'm taking advantage of the worldwide governance indicators developed by the World Bank, by Dr. Danny Kaufman, R. Craig, and, and Maximo uh, Mastrucci, that, you know, that, that give us you know, the good governance agenda. Right? Basically telling countries, if you, have, uh, if you are able to deal with these six aspects of good governance, then you will be bound to, you know, to improve your development um, aspects. The differences between East Asia and the Pacific and Latin America are not that dramatic, right? Sorry, I could not put you know, the two graphs um, together. So, you know, but you know, uh, overall, the message is they are not that different, the two regions, right? In aggregate terms, right? Um, especially when one looks at the control of, of, of corruption uh, tra uh, trajectories from 1996, right? Very similar levels of corruption, one would uh, assume, in, in both uh, regions. So the question that I always had, right, by, by scanning uh, uh, the two regions um, is, well, you know, what is going to make the difference, you know? Why is it that some societies are more successful than others in dealing with these issues of, of, of good governance um, or um, transparency, right? Um, if one looks at the, uh, the, uh, the global map, right, then again, you know, you see some differentiation between the Latin American countries in terms of control of corruption in 2012, right, uh, with red, meaning high levels of corruption and green lower levels of corruption, right? But you know, the, 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 the distribution from East Asia and the Pacific and Latin America, again, you know, are highly uh, similar uh, in that uh, regards. Same with Transparency International Corruption Perception Index, but I don't want to spend too much time on this index because I think that it's very problematic, right? I know that some people like it, right? But, uh, but, but it has its problem. Then, now, we are shifting the debate, right? At the end of that shift of, 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 of the relationship between democracy and development and the transition towards uh, our transparency, something happened in, in, in the international community in the development context. You know, perhaps Latin America moved first with the Inter-American inter Convention Against um, Corruption that basically set up a policy framework for countries 
you know, to follow in order to improve uh, their governance, you know, to increase the levels of transparency and to reduce um, corruption. The, this was followed by the um, approval in the early 2000s of the UN Convention Against Corruption <coughs> that basically gives all these countries, irrespective of their political system, with a policy tool, with a platform, with a benchmark, right, to deal with the issues uh, of corruption. And very quickly, right, in the history of the UN, sometimes, you know, the, 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 the entry into force of these type of global conventions takes a long time, right? The UN Convention is the second fastest ratifying convention in the history of the UN, second after the Convention of the Protection of, the Ch of Children, uh, for example. So countries jumped very quickly, they ventured very quickly to all to say, yes, we are going to adhere to these standards, we are all going to be transparent, you know, we are all apt to the fight um, against um, corruption. Um, so then, again, you know, the question is, if everybody is following the same model, the same platform, right, you know, we can criticize whether, you know, this is the right political platform, right, for, you know, for, for, for triggering substantive changes um, or not. Why is it that, you know, we have this differentiation that the governance indicators is telling us. You know, why are some countries more successful than others in uh, dealing with the issues of, uh, of corruption? The answer is, be, I believe, is that we need to move to a more unorthodox approaches to the issue of good governance and, and go beyond the traditional governance and democracy debate and try to understand first what are the political settlements, but right? What are the interactions between the institutional structures and the distribution of powers at the country level, right? There is where one starts to, 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 to understand, right, what are the different economic outcomes that comes from, the politi from different political systems, right? What makes, for example, countries like China and Vietnam have, you know, the impressive rates of economic growth, you know, that they are having now, under you know one-party communist uh, regimes, right? Vis-a-vis -vis, you know the more pluri cult uh, uh, political political systems in Latin America, such as you know Brazil, right, and Mexico, uh, for example, right? That one could think you know that have some uh, relationship uh, with these um, two countries. How do these political settlements emerge <coughs> when the systems achieve? minimum economic and political uh, viability. And here, Professor Mushta Khan from the London, uh, University of London uh, School of Oriental and Asian Studies, you know, have been working on this, um, on, on this new approach to, of political settlements, right, uh, to deal with these issues of, um, of corruption and, you know, challenging, you know, the good governance um, approach, right? It's not just you know, where countries are located, but how these political settlements are dealt and are uh, um, 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 distributed, you know, the power distributed um, in societies. You know, what makes, uh, for example, New Zealand much more successful than Costa Rica, that have very similar um, characteristics, right? Or what makes Jamaica, right, in the Caribbean, uh, be more successful than Papua New Guinea here in the Pacific, uh, for example. What happens, you know, between the relationship between Mexico and uh, Vietnam, right? Um, that, that have, you know, similar sizes in terms of population, in terms of, 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 of land, right? They have the same advantages and same disadvantages, right? The both are closed to the economic engines, right? Uh, Vietnam, south of China, Mexico, south of the United States, right? Um, what made Mexico make that transition, right, from the one-party system, right, during 70 years, you know, to a more pluri uh, political system, right? And Vietnam remained so entrenched, you know, within, within the, you know, the one-party, communist uh, regime and uh, model. The answer to that 
right, according to Professor Kahn, will be on the political settlements, on the distribution of, uh, of power uh, relationships, and all these you know, uh, um, different um, uh, uh, either patrimonial or clientelistic uh, approaches, or whether you know, the type of corruption is efficient or inefficient you know, for the distribution of uh, resources. Um, this approach by Professor Kahn also challenges that orthodoxy, right? That, you know, this good governance approach or these receipts of the UN Convention Against Corruption, for example, misses, you know, that there are many types of corruption, right? And, you know, it, you know in, in, in order, you know, to, 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 to improve, you know, um, to understand, you know, for example, conflict of interest that, you know, Dr. Ochoa will be sp uh, speaking later, right? One needs to understand, right, what are the uh, 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 connections, the networks, you know, the patronage, the levels of nepotism that exist in particular societies that either enhances or diminishes these uh, potentially damaging um, aspects of um, development. And then start thinking about, you know, what are the potentially beneficial interventions, right, and have, you know, a very you know uh, what Professor Khan is uh, is 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 uh, proposing is you know is 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 a very simple two by two um, uh, typology of of political settlements <coughs> and cases of corruption when you have some damaging interventions in terms of 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 the type of policies that are designed that are more market restricting um, uh, um, um, activities and other that are more um, a state containing and corruption type of um, activities. One can also think about these uh, growth enhancing governance cap you know, capacities and again in, in, in try you know, to see you know, what are the differences between the e East Asia and the Pacific and the Latin American countries, right? Um, Indonesia and Brazil, right? In terms of, of um, corrupt practices. Peru and Philippines, right? About, you know, these political settlements, right? When one thinks about, you know, Peru, you know, on corruption issues, you know, the picture that comes to my mind is, is, is the Fujimori and the Montesinos case, right? Which is, was basically predatory type of, you know, corruption uh, practices. When one thinks about Philippines, right, Marcos, Right, is you know what comes you know to mind you know also you know with very similar predatory type of you know uh, of of corruption uh, uh, dynamics you know happening you know around um, the same time or the case of Indonesia uh, with uh, with uh, Suharto, uh, for example, right? How are those rents that are generated by you know by these different uh, political settlements uh, distributed and generated, right? I know that I'm running just, you know, out of time, right? But, you know, very quickly, you know, the last two slides that I have is that, you know, also, right, um, what is it that we want to improve, right, in terms of the policy issue? And you know, what is it that we want to compare, right, on, 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 on these um, two regions, right? Um, and here, you know, um, and this graph basically shows, you know, how countries across regions, you know, have made uh, significant improvements in their human development levels, as measured by uh, my organization, um, UNDP, right? And the first thing that I that I noted, you know, when when I plotted, you know, this uh, 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 trend, is that, well, it seems that the East Asia and the Pacific region is catching up faster with the Latin American countries than when one normally uh, assumes, right? In the 1980s, right, the gap between the East Asia and the Pacific and the Latin American country was around 26%, right, on, 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 on the Human Development uh, Index. And over the year, you know, it's been the East Asia and the Pacific, you know, that is catching up. Uh, sorry, the East Asia is, 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 is the red, so it's, it's even hi uh, higher was around 30% here, and now is less than 
in the year 2013, right? There was much more, there seems to be in the last 15 years, much more economic dynamism on the East Asia and the Pacific. Last night, you know, we were having dinner with Dr. Fenwick and Dr. Ochoa, and then I was part of that discussion, right? When I go back to Latin America, my impression after living, you know, almost a decade in East Asia is that the East Asian economies are much more dynamic, right, than the economies in Latin America. There seems to be more movement uh, happening, right? There are more trade, you know, more relationship across um, countries, there, there, you know, uh, but that could also be a function that they are coming from a lower level of development, right? And the elasticity of the indicator, you know, it's much more higher for countries with, with high levels of development um, to make um, improvement. But then again, you know, um, as I was uh, making the comparisons earlier, right, what are the, the overall development trajectories, you know, that one can think of of, of, of these two regions? Right? What makes, what causes these differences, these divergences in terms of, of, of performance? You know, very classical, you know, uh, uh, development uh, indicator, GDP per capita, right? Look at the relationship between Costa Rica and New Zealand, very similar countries in terms of size, in terms of population, in terms of, of, of agricultural outputs, right? And their transition, you know, towards, you know, you know more um, sophisticated tertiary sector um, economies, right? In the late 1960s, right, they weren't, they weren't that different in terms of GDP per capita, right? Very close uh, uh, to each other, right? But then New Zealand starts differentiating very rapidly in the 1970s, right? During the 1980s, the lost decade in Latin America, right? Um, Costa Rica also stagnated in terms of, of GDP growth, right? What explains those differences, right? And I think that, you know, uh, um, the, 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 the pair um, case, you know, comparison, you know, will lead us, you know, that it was, you know, the political settlements in New Zealand were different than those um, uh, in Costa Rica, right? Um, or in the case of, again, you know, the two, you know, islands with quite similar characteristics, right? Uh, Jamaica in the Caribbean and, uh, and Papua New Guinea um, in the Pacific. Again, um, during the 60s, 70s, and 80s, you know, they were very similar. Even in 1984, right, they were, uh, you know, very close uh, to each other in terms of their levels of GDP uh, per capita. <coughs> but then in the 90s, Jamaica seems to be, you know, differentiating substantially from uh, uh, PNG, right? And you know, even you know, in the in the early 2000s, there was a period of recession happening in Papua New Guinea. You know, all these you know conflict uh, that you know th that arose uh, um, uh, in the island and so forth. And then Mexico and Indonesia, right? Again, in the late 1960s, you know, both countries, you know. Uh, have you know similar levels of development, but again something happens. So I couldn't find you know uh, 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 countries you know with similar w w which one can think of you know similar characteristics in terms of size, in terms of the economy, and see some level of consistency in 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 um, in the indicator. Something happened right I, either benefiting countries in one region right as in the case of Costa Rica and New Zealand, or on the other region, as in the case of Jamaica and, and, and PNG, or Mexico and um, Indonesia, right? What were the political settlements, you know? Is, what happened, for example, with the, during the Suharto era in Indonesia, right, that affected these levels of, of, of growth, right? It's not to say that Mexico had less corruption, Right during that period, because I, you know, I don't think that, that you know that that was the case. But perhaps you know the type of predatory, corruption types of of, of political settlements, you know, influence somehow that uh, levels of uh, growth.
and you know what happened you know in 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 in, in Jamaica and 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 PNG one can also start thinking about you know you know um, other fair comparisons you know as I was mentioning earlier you know I think that uh, Vietnam and Mexico has more things in common than one can normally assume uh, from these uh, two countries. Just looking about the geographic uh, location of the two um, countries and you know the importance that they place right in Mexico vis-a-vis -vis the five Central American countries you know and how the five Central American countries tend to look at Mexico in order to make you know the movement uh, north to uh, the United States. In the case of Vietnam how the Mekong River Delta countries, Cambodia, Laos, uh, Myanmar, looked at Vietnam as if they were the big brother uh, in the equation and they are looking at you know, what is Vietnam doing and how Vietnam can be the bridge you know, to move north um, to um, China. So I think that um, uh, it's, you know, uh, you know, perhaps this is you know the, 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 the two traditional you know academic type of conclusion, right? More research is needed, you know, in terms of this uh, association. But I think that um, w what is missing is that interregional type of pair comparisons, right? <coughs> um, and here, you know, one suggestion for the Latin American Center for ANCLAS, you know, would be. Right, you know, to try to understand, you know, these differences, you know, across countries with similar characteristics in both regions. Right, I don't remember, right, from my years uh, in Oxford to having any colleague, you know, working on a pair comparison between Latin America and Asia countries. Right, either you know we are we you know we are thinking about Mexico and Brazil, Costa Rica and El Salvador, right. Uh, Dominican Republic and um, Venezuela, right? Uh, and in the Asian uh, region, you know, we are thinking about Vietnam and Indonesia, Thailand and Philippines, uh, PNG and Fiji, right? But, you know, perhaps, you know, you know th th these pair comparisons can be expanded, you know, to try to understand, you know, how, you know, these um, uh, 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 political settlements, you know, are uh, uh, allowing some countries to have different levels of development um, and so forth. And uh, with this, I end my presentation. Thank you very much.